Thank you uh, very much, and I'm very happy to be here, especially since I landed uh, 50 minutes ago. So uh, I can say, that Dr. Armstrong, that passport control is better here than it will be uh, in many other cities that we all visit. Uh, my research and consulting relationships all this in the wind. I, I will point out, in the, sort of in the spirit of this talk, that you'll see more and more of the kind of people that all of us are beginning to work with are mobile health companies, uh, uh, technology firms, informatics firms, et cetera. So uh, the world indeed is, uh, is very much changing. I also want to thank a number of my colleagues at Stanford for, uh, for help with this. And l let me go through my outline. I'm, I'm going to appropriately pay homage to, uh, to the professor, and uh, I, I'm sorry that I missed some of it this morning, though I will thank my friend Lisa Burdan, who was sending me pictures of slides as the morning was going along, and I'm just disappointed, Franz, that I don't think I'll be able to match your fantastic slide set, but, uh, but a fun nonetheless. Lisa also thought it was fun to uh, begin the day with a uh, discussion of fibrinolysis, which is really what brought the group together, and end the day with a discussion of companies like Google and Apple and the kind of projects we're doing with them. I'll talk a little bit about challenges in the world of clinical research, and I suspect that this has been done this morning, maybe particularly by Rob. And then we'll talk about what's needed and how technology innovators are leading some of these efforts. We'll talk a bit about Silicon Valley, talk a bit about uh, how one thinks about increasing the scientific yield of, uh, of early discovery. Eric has talked about simplifying large trials, and I, I won't do that. I will, however, talk about learning healthcare, leveraging data, concepts like deep learning, some of the things that, uh, that IBM Watson are engaged with. I'll spend some time having fun talking to you about the role of social media, both as a tool of academic communication, but maybe more seriously as a role to engage our, uh, our patients in, uh, in the conduct of clinical research and recognizing that there'll be uh, trainees here in the room, residents, fellows, we'll, spend, we'll, we'll end the presentation uh, having some discussion around education and training. So Paul is a former chair of medicine. You'll appreciate where I was last night. I had to host the, uh, gradu this is graduation weekend at Stanford, and I had to host the graduating resident dinner last night. These are our, uh, our residents. You also, Paul, being a man of, uh, of many talents, almost I would say a Renaissance man, will note the, uh, the sculpture that they're in front of, which the Stanford residents like to take at the end of their journey through residency, and uh, it's Rodin's Gates of Hell. In the, uh, in the Rodin Garden on the Stanford campus, actually right across from my office. So, uh, so it's an apt metaphor that the, uh, that the residents cleverly select for their, uh, for their final picture, and I, think, I thought Paul might appreciate that. I, I also thought Paul might appreciate this picture, and on a, a serious note, this is, uh, this is our new grandson, Sawyer Ray, who's now uh, eight months old. And one of the lessons that Paul has taught me, maybe more than any of my other friends, colleagues, and mentors, is that Paul has really taught me the, uh, the real importance of one's balance in one's life. And particularly, I'm glad Bev's here because Paul has taught many of us the balance of family and professional obligations. And so thank you, Paul, because that has been an important part of my life, and I think uh, I've learned it from you. Well, I suspect this picture has been shown several times this morning. And, uh, and I put this up here because this is, in some ways, where much of the collaboration begins. Uh, you'll note that, uh, that, that Paul, Franz, Rob, all in this picture, no offense to Franz and Paul, but Rob's the only one that kind of looks the same as he did back in uh, the early 1990s. Um, Lisa Burdan and I were not in this picture, but Lisa and I were, uh, were manning the Gusto hotline in, uh, in those days, and along with Magnus Oman and Chris Granger, uh, took all the hotline calls, with the exception of the one that Rob still claims that he took over the uh, three years of the trial. But I think the rest of them were aptly manned by, uh, by Lisa Magnus, uh, Chris, and myself. And my relationship with Paul has really um, gone through a number of clinical trials, and uh, I too look different than when Paul began working with me on the uh, East Coast. I, as my wife likes to point out, I both had hair and it was brown. And, uh, and as I've moved to the West, we've continued that collaboration, and my relationship with Paul has been not only rich personally, but, uh, but very productive professionally. And I've been blessed to uh, be able to tap into not just Paul's wisdom, but a wonderful collaboration with colleagues here at, uh, at the Canadian Vigor Center 
This is last year when I visited um, Edmonton in, uh, in April. Now one would think if you visit April, Edmonton in April that you would be uh, watching the flowers bloom and it would be a beautiful day. You'll note that the hardy Canadian is in his shirt sleeves and the wimp who lives in California has a sweater on in addition to his jacket. It's because there was two inches of snow when I woke up uh, that morning to, uh, to greet me when I came to visit Edmonton. So uh, as often is the case with uh, Professor Armstrong, surprises abound when one has him in our lives. But on a serious note, I think that Paul has really been the driving force, uh, along with uh, leaders like Rob, readers like Franz, and I think uh, nicely with them plus Eric here, it really shows the power of collaboration and what a group of committed individuals can do together over the period of time. And uh, Paul, perhaps more than anybody else, of the original Gusto group that then morphed into the Vigor group and has done a series of clinical research projects together, has really been a passionate believer in, uh, in collaboration and not just one-off collaborations, but a really sustaining collaboration. And if I think about the innovations that Paul has, uh, is, that, that really fits nicely with my theme of uh, thinking about biotech and technology innovation, Paul's innovation was really to bring us all together but keep us together. And uh, as I now have the um, privilege of looking out across an entire department of medicine, what's happened in cardiology is not typical. And uh, we don't typically see vast, ongoing, two, three decade collaborations. We see some, but I would say that the entire field of uh, ischemic heart disease is marked by uh, collaborations in large part uh, begun by people like Paul Franz and Rob uh, 25 to 30 years ago, and that's unusual, in, uh, at least in U.S. medicine, and so we have, I think, uh, Professor Armstrong to, to thank for that. So as I think about that as a backdrop of how we've all come together to work together, and what are the things that we're trying to solve going forward, I, I put this slide up with some of the key societal themes and issues that are confronting us certainly in the U.S., but I think uh, more globally as well, and really form the basis of uh, some of the challenges that we're trying to solve problems for. Certainly with uh, the Affordable Care Act in the United States, uh, quality and accountability are increasingly important components of our health care system and health care reform, and more and more of what we do is, uh, is being driven by the concept of accountable care organizations. Now, where I live in California, this is actually a small but growing part of, uh, of health care. On the East Coast, it's increasingly a large part of American health care. In Massachusetts, accountable care organizations probably account for close to 60% of the care delivered in the state of Massachusetts. And what that really signals is a shift from caring just for the individual and not worrying so much about the population to a system where one cares for both, where one has to think about the health of a population and one has to think about the care of the individual. And that's a theme that I'll keep coming back to and how technology is going to help enable us to do that. I suspect that uh, all of my uh, prior speakers have talked about uh, the fact that guidelines-based care is quality care and yet much of what we do in contemporary medicine, including cardiology, has a relatively low quality of evidence uh, which guides clinical decision making. And I'll show you uh, some of that data from work by Eric and others momentarily. And I'll also put forward to you that um, even in a country as diverse and with such diverse healthcare systems as the United States, I think you've seen in Eric's presentation about electronic health records and some of the ways we can leverage that to do uh, medical research. And, and, and I'll step away. Interestingly, the outcomes guy talked about trials, and the uh, trials guy is going to talk about observations. Uh, but that was a good switch. And again, in keeping with what I think Justin probably learned from Professor Armstrong to keep us all on our toes and keep us all learning. Well, this is uh, work by Eric, which I think is uh, by now a landmark piece of work because it really is the, uh, the first time in cardiovascular medicine that, it, that a real quantitative link was made between guidelines-based practice and clinical outcomes. And I still find this astonishing that, uh, that in the U.S., for a disease for which there's 1.2 million hospital admissions a year, 
uh, that there is a 2% absolute difference in mortality, mortality for a group of patients who are treated at a low quality hospital versus a high quality hospital. And this is not high tech stuff. This is, did you get aspirin? Did you get statins? Did you get beta blockers? The, these are really simple measures. And uh, the, the figure here of every 10% increase in guideline adherence translates to a corresponding 10% decrease in mortality, I think is, uh, is striking and certainly worth reflecting on. And it's worth reflecting on in part because of uh, this piece uh, led by Rob with uh, one of our former fellows, Pierluigi Tricosi, as, uh, as the lead author, which really pointed out that even in a field like cardiology, which is so evidence-driven and so guideline-driven, that the vast majority of the decisions we make, the recommendations that are in our guidelines, are actually buttressed by a relatively low level of evidence in an area that all of us here that, that are speaking today are working in, the area of acute coronary disease, only somewhere between 15 and 24 percent of the recommendations in the practice guidelines are supported by the highest level of evidence. Now, I, I see that both as uh, disappointing but also as the challenge. And uh, the challenge and the opportunity is to rethink the way we're doing trials. You've seen some of that from Eric and rethink the way that we're getting data to help inform practitioners, including at the point of care, a topic that I'll come back to because there is so much work to be done. It's also a challenging time for those of us that do think about global clinical trials. This is a, a compilation of, uh, of trials uh, largely coordinated by the DCRI, frequently, if not always, in collaboration with Franz and with Paul and with other colleagues around the globe, and really showing the changing distribution of where patients were enrolled in those clinical trials. From Gusto One, the trial, as I showed you the picture, that really brought uh, many of us together, up to the more recent atrial fibrillation trials or the IMPROVE IT trials, showing the decreasing amount of patients that come from enrollment in the United States. Canada, you'll note, has pretty much held steady over the years, I think reflecting the commitment of uh, Canadian cardiovascular investigators to the, uh, to the process. And as Franz knows well, as one of the key European leaders, both Western and Eastern Europe have been the mainstays of, uh, of global clinical trials in cardiovascular medicine for decades now. Now there's much good on here that as, uh, as you all know, ischemic heart disease is now the world's leading cause of death and disability in every region of the globe with the exception of sub-Sahara Africa. And so the fact that we now have clinical trials in cardiovascular medicine being performed all over the globe is in many ways a good thing. But I think for those of us who are trying to make decisions on our practice patents and our systems of care, some of the challenges in the U.S. Are, uh, are, are particularly noteworthy and maybe problematic, and there has to be simpler ways to do things. There's a slide, like many, that I borrow from, uh, from Lisa Burdan, which I think shows an extraordinary amount of, uh, of information. For the trials aficionados in the room, try to tell me what trial it is. Uh, Lisa, you can't be sitting next to Lisa and ask the question, but uh, see if you can tell what trial it is. But look at the amount of work that went into this particular trial. This particular way of doing clinical trials is just not sustainable if we're going to fill those evidence gaps that needs to be filled. And the kind of things that Eric is talking about, embedding clinical trials into registries, embedding clinical trials into uh, electronic health records, are clearly something that's sorely needed. And Dr. Califf and I uh, put this editorial together a couple of years ago that dealt with the notion that even the U.S. government-sponsored trials, the NIH trials, are largely now being conducted outside of the United States. And we noted that it was particularly ironic that American taxpayer clinical trials were now largely being offshored or outsourced to other places around the globe. And Rob and I noted that this report was one of a number of reports that raised the question of whether clinical research in the states, like so many of our other industries, had become so expensive and inefficient that it was no longer a viable competitive enterprise within the borders. And so somehow we've got to be able to address that. Because here's one of the realities that we're facing today. Those of us who are interested in trying to develop new therapies for for the world's leading cause of death and disability, ischemic heart disease. 
And this is a uh, interesting perspective piece which, occur which uh, appeared in the New England Journal last year by Bob Kocher. Now Bob, uh, who Rob knows well, is an interesting guy. Many of us first met him when he was a McKinsey consultant and uh, helped with a lot of the reorganization of, uh, of DCRI. He then spent time in the Obama White House uh, working with, uh, with Zeke Manuel, where he was really instrumental in, uh, in the writing of the legislation for the Affordable Care Act. And now in the true sweep of justice, he's now a, a venture capitalist working in, uh, in the Palo Alto area and, uh, and has a very unique perspective on the notion of drug development but what he says is that many drugs designed for orphan diseases and cancer are good investments of scarce capital since they tend to have low development costs. Well, translate that. What that means is that they don't have to spend a lot of money. They don't have to study a lot of patients around the globe. They have a high probability of success because of some of the background science known in orphan diseases and cancers. And then they can turn around and sell these therapies for a lot of money. Uh, for those of us that are interested in the common diseases like cardiovascular disease, this represents, again, both a problem and an opportunity. So I'm going to walk you through here. If we look at that as the backdrop of some of the challenges in clinical research, how might technology innovation help us do this? And why do we, do we see that the focus is really moving away from global pharmaceutical companies helping us solve these problems? to technology companies helping us solve these problems. And we'll talk a bit about Silicon Valley, and as I said, we'll, uh, we'll go through these other steps with one exception. We're not going to talk about large trials uh, because I know Eric did this. Well, first, Silicon Valley. You'll note that in order to uh, give my colleagues here in Canada a view of Silicon Valley, I too went to a technology source. I went to Wikipedia to give you the definition. And it's a nickname for the southern portion of San Francisco Bay Area. It really stretches, and I'll show you the map, from San Francisco down to the San Jose area. That's about a 60-mile stretch. And it's generally used as a metonym for the American high technology economic sector. And I suspect that uh, probably only Dr. Armstrong knows what metonym actually is. It's a commonly accepted phrase, and uh, I too had to look that up. But it really is what people refer to when they talk about tech. They really, t they, they use Silicon Valley as a uh, interchangeable phrase. Because Silicon Valley has become the leading hub in the startup ecosystem for tech innovation in the United States, and interestingly, it accounts for one-third of all the venture capital investment in the United States. And this is just a look at the Bay Area stretching on the top from, uh, from San Francisco up here with the Golden Gate Bridge down here to uh, the San Jose area. Stanford University is somewhere about the middle of that area, which puts us very uniquely positioned in the Bay Area of being able to interact with many of these companies. And you can see that there are literally dozens, if not hundreds, of tech companies concentrated in this area. And if you take a snapshot of some of the ones that you're most familiar with thinking about, companies like Google and Facebook and IBM and eBay and Apple, there's literally tens if not hundreds of thousands of people, most of whom are engineers and scientists and quantitative scientists. And so when you think about problems that involve technology being solved, this is an enormous concentration of intellectual capital in, uh, in the United States to really bring to bear on some of these problems. And where did it begin in Silicon Valley? And, and I think that this quote from a book of the founders, uh, from Hewlett and Packard, of, uh, of the founding of Silicon Valley, this advice is really, I think, what is most apt in Silicon Valley today that the greatest success goes to the person who is not afraid to fail in front of even the largest audience. And that ethos in, uh, in the Bay Area of failing is, uh, is very well accepted. Uh, some joke that uh, it's not that if you found a company you're a successful person, it's how many did you fail with before you, uh, you found it something successful. Because what it means is that you're not letting failure deter you. You're learning from your failures and you're moving on. And that's one of the great lessons from, uh, from Hewlett and Packett. The other major idea that, uh, that really spurned what is today Silicon Valley comes from Xerox. And what Xerox did back in the 70s and 80s is that they created a research think tank in the Palo Alto Research Center up Park and they invested huge sums of money for the time 
and pretty much let people roam free to, uh, to pursue interesting ideas, largely in this case in the area of computer science. This is where the Apple mouse was, uh, was, direct, was invented. This is where the PC was largely conceptualized. And if you go back and you read this book, Dealers of Lightning, which is a really interesting book on the history of Silicon Valley, you will even see figures that back in the 60s and 70s look like the iPad today as people began to conceptualize what are the things that this new device, the computer, might be able to do. And every day when I drive home from, uh, from the campus to, uh, to where I live, about seven, eight miles from campus, I drive by a, uh, a small bar that uh, is actually the bar whereby the first email was sent many, uh, many decades ago, and it still has quite a reputation as a place where the tech people hang out. Stanford also becomes an interesting part of this, and at the very beginning, the notion that one can connect the university to commercial entities in a seamless way was very important to the development of Silicon Valley, and I think to the development of innovation. And I put this up here because today, with the emphasis on conflict of interest and relationship with industry, and sometimes the lack of what I'll call an adult conversation about all of this, is, uh, is really problematic. And, uh, and I think many of us who are working in clinical research today, many of the great discoveries of things like Franz talked about with fibrinolysis would not have been possible without tight collaboration with, um, with industry. Obviously appropriate interaction and collaboration, but, uh, and Paul and Franz and Rob and Eric have written much about this. But this is some of the facts about, um, about some, of the ther some of the technologies discovered at Stanford. And uh, you may, uh, the, the people who uh, think about this will certainly jump to this one, the page rank al algorithm. That was the basis, the intellectual property basis for Google. Uh, those were, uh, were two Stanford graduate students uh, working in, uh, in computer science. So as we think, now we've seen the challenges, you've, think, you've thought a bit about the, uh, the environment of, uh, of technology incubation and technology innovation. What are some of the things we're actually working on? Uh, and much of this is work that we're all doing here together, and I will present it in a way to, uh, to really present the themes of the work rather than some of the, uh, the real granular details of the work. The first is something that I think is really an important lesson that I've been learning more and more by reading the writings of Joe Lascalzel over the last few years, who's the chair of medicine at Brigham and Women, and that's this notion that we've got to do a better job with early discovery and early translation, and that we've got to do a better job of learning from our friends in other disciplines, systems biology, systems pharmacology, network analyses, et cetera, and take advantage of the richness of the biologic data that's frequently collected in early experiments, particularly translational experiments, that we tend not to. And this is a paper that came out of the Framingham uh, Heart Study Group just a couple of weeks ago in molecular systems biology, which I think is a great example, a very applied example, of what Lascalzo is talking about. In this case, a very sophisticated network analysis is lending new insights into the molecular mechanisms of blood pressure regulation, blood pressure control. And if you accept that blood pressure control remains one of the world's major clinical problems, understanding very unique targets to potentially approach the problem of blood pressure uh, control and regulation are worth reflecting upon. So my first comment is I think we need to dive deeper into, uh, into physiologic data. I was also very influenced and very impressed by this commentary that appeared in Nature a few weeks ago. So as many of you know, I'm someone who has spent a lot of time, along with many others in the room, thinking about and working on large trials. And this was a very interesting commentary in Nature a few weeks ago calling for the, uh, the one-person trial. Now this is not the first time that the one-person trial has uh, been called for. Tom Chambers years ago uh, wrote a commentary that said, let's randomize the first patient. And, uh, but this is really a bit of a different view. This is saying that the richness of one's physiologic data over time in response to a variety of stimuli, including therapeutics, really warrants being studied in a big data sort of way. 
and I thought it appropriate at, uh, at a gathering of, uh, of the Gusto clan that, uh, that I bring uh, one of the key leaders of the Gusto clan onto the screen, and that's Eric Topol. And uh, Eric, along with Rob, were really two of the key leaders of, uh, of the Gusto um, series of clinical trials. And I had the privilege a couple of days ago of interviewing Eric for, uh, for a podcast on Medscape, and we talked about the patient we'll see you now. And if you haven't read it, I would definitely recommend you do read it because the popular press hasn't done it justice in terms of some of the uh, provocative ideas. And one of the things that Eric is definitely talking about is the richness of data from the individual and how we need to do a better job with that. And one of his central themes is what's seen in The Economist a few years ago, and that we've now become the planet of the phone. Uh, I, I was over visiting with Rob's friend uh, Andy Conrad a couple of days ago at Google Life Science, and Andy told me that now uh, 1.3 billion people in the world now have a smartphone. Not just a phone, they have a smartphone. And, uh, and that number is increasing. And why is that number increasing? It's because data is getting cheaper and cheaper and the storage of data is getting cheaper and cheaper, and your ability to move around large amounts of data is, uh, is getting cheaper and cheaper. And this opens up all sorts of opportunities for collecting information. And it includes how we start to collect information from a variety of wearable devices. I suspect that many of you are wearing physiologic monitors in the crowd. You're wearing Fitbits and you're wearing Jawbone devices and some of you might even be wearing an Apple Watch. But all of this is going to provide a tremendous amount of data, big data, and it's going to require an enormous amount of effort to begin to make sense of that. And the amount of effort that's going to be to make sense of that is not going to come necessarily from the universities. It's not going to come from traditional sources. It's going to come from places like Google and Amazon and Apple who can amass hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of computer scientists, engineers, programmers, statisticians, informaticians to answer questions and to look for useful patterns within the data. And so with that, um, Rob really led the, uh, the inception of what's now being called the baseline study. And you can see that this really does a couple of things. One of which is it, uh, it furthers that collaboration that began a long time ago in, uh, in Gusto with, uh, between Stanford and Duke now, with the friendships that have developed over those many years. And it involves a collaboration with probably one of the leading tech companies in the, uh, in the globe. And uh, in fr true keeping with Google, this is not a small task. What the mission of the study is, is to develop an integrated understanding of human health. Pretty big topic. If you put that in a NIH report, I suspect it would get sent back to you as, uh, as not very thoughtful. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> but it's going, to, uh, it's going to be done. And there's going to really be, uh, I think, three things that this study will form the basis of, and hence the name baseline. Uh, number one, and you might imagine Google's interest in this, it's going to create a deep biomedical information structure. The estimate is, and I'll show you the patient structure, et cetera, for each of 10,000 patients on every visit, each patient will generate four terabytes worth of data. So think about that amount of data and what Google's interest is in, uh, in creating a structure to deal with that. Uh, the teams from Duke and Stanford are going to Los Angeles next week where a pilot study has been done with about 50 patients enrolled, uh, 50 subjects enrolled, and they are struggling with how to figure out that amount of data on 50 patients. We're proposing by fall to start a study with 10,000. And I'll show you the, uh, the, the, the second two aims on the next few slides. We're interested in really trying to understand what normal is and uh, in utilizing large samples to uh, determine that. We're, use, we're going to be using a lot of novel techniques of predictive analytics and, uh, and deep learning. We'll talk a bit more about deep learning in uh, the IBM section. And we're going to try to understand uh, a whole new series of, uh, of wearable devices made by Google Life Science. And uh, this is stuff that is really out there in terms of what it can do and being able to put it up to, uh, to test with 10,000 individuals, I think will be quite extraordinary. 
Well, these 10,000 individuals will be enrolled in, uh, in North Carolina and in North, Northern California, uh, 5,000 at Duke and 5,000 at, uh, at Stanford. They'll be in two cohorts, a cancer cohort and a cardiovascular cohort. There'll be a low-risk cohort that has neither overt disease nor risk factors. There'll be a high-risk cohort niche, meaning people with overt disease and the third, I mean, with risk factors, and a third cohort where people will, be, will have overt disease and be felt to be at high risk for occurrence. And people are going to have an uh, astonishing amount of, uh, of material collected. It's estimated that the first visit is going to take somewhere between 8 and 12 hours, and the study teams right now are trying to figure out how to maximize the use of that time and maximize the collection of all of this data. Patients will follow through the web. They'll also follow live longitudinally. And so there'll be blood measured for every omics that is uh, both currently thought of and might be thought of in the future. Uh, there's going to be a heavy emphasis, and in part this is the Stanford um, and Duke interest in immune, human immune monitoring. And so there'll be a heavy emphasis on uh, understanding the immunology, heavy emphasis on imaging. There'll also be... Um, old-fashioned physical examinations and how physical examination findings might correlate with some of these newer findings of, uh, or new ways of assessment. As I noted, the, uh, the, the overall leader of the project from Google is Andy Conrad, Sam Gambier, our chair of radiology, and Ken Mahaffey, who many of you know, who's the vice chair of clinical research in the department, are leading from the Stanford end, and Eric and uh, Kristen Newby are leading from the, uh, from the Duke end. But in real fairness, I would say that Rob has been the, uh, the inspiration for all three parties in, uh, in moving this study forward. And some of you may have seen that uh, there's uh, different routes now in academia. And uh, some of you know Jessica Mega from uh, the Harvard Brigham and Women's and Timmy Group. And uh, in the middle of May, she announced that she was moving from the Brigham and Women to work for Google Life Science, particularly to work on this particular project. Um, now, uh, Jessica is a Stanford grad. Uh, she's a North Carolina native and a Stanford grad, and so it's almost perfect that she's uh, working on this project, which involves a collaboration of the, uh, of the two coasts in the university. I've put this up only to remind me to, uh, to uh, give credit to Eric for talking about the simplification of clinical trials and thanking that I didn't have to do it. Um, I think this was about the Improve It trial, randomized, double brine, 20,000 patients, 10 years. Unfortunately, we've forgotten why. But uh, I suspect you could all put a name of a trial in there that you've worked on that, uh, that would fit these characteristics. The next topic I want to get into beyond trying to do the deep dive in how one thinks about big data being collected on individuals is how to start to think about health systems and leveraging data of health systems. One of the ways to leverage data from health systems is to do what Eric talked about, which is to embed clinical trials into electronic health records. In the United States, the Institute of Medicine has written about this in a, uh, and I think a very um, articulate fashion to really talk about how does one create a system of learning within, uh, within the academic health system. And it, and it is interesting, when you talk to um, patients, and uh, uh, in, in part because of my friendship with Eric Topol, I end up seeing a lot of the tech executives in my clinic because they all have chest pain. They all call Eric for advice. He doesn't want to see them, so he says, why don't you go see my friend Bob Harrington at Stanford? And uh, when you tell people, they say, what are you working on? And you say, well, one of the things we're interested in is the learning healthcare system. He, they say, well, isn't that a little silly? You're at a university. Aren't you guys learning all the time? And then when we point out that, in fact, in academic medicine, we don't learn all the time from, uh, from what we're doing and how do we uh, really get better health care by continuously learning. We're, we're doing this at Stanford through something that's part of our CTSA from the NIH in our Population Health Science Initiative and really trying to build a learning health care network throughout the greater Bay Area. Stanford, over the last couple of years, has gone from being a university hospital on campus to really, I think, being a an an, uh, regionally oriented academic, <coughs> integrated academic healthcare system with two hospitals on campus, adult and pediatric, building two more hospitals on campus and, uh, and extending out to hundreds of providers who are now part of the uh, Stanford Medicine Network in the, uh, in the regional environment. We've put the common electronic medical record at all of those centers 
as they get launched into our network and how are we going to take advantage of this. Well, Rob always likes it when I show this slide, which is the, the, from the Harvard Business Review, data scientist being the sexiest job of the 21st century. And then he always shows this slide. Yeah, it might be data science is sexy, but the real work is, uh, is janitorial. It's really figuring out how to connect the dots of all of that disparate data that's coming in from a place in, like Stanford. And by US standards, Stanford is a small to medium-sized academic medical system. We're about a $4 billion healthcare system. Contrast that with something like Partners in Boston, in Massachusetts, it's about $11 billion healthcare system. And just the work of being able to pull all this information together is extraordinary. So in, in, a, in a paper that um, I was fortunate to be a part of with two of our informaticians, one on the pediatric side, one on the adult side, we put forward this notion of uh, what I would say is the sexy part of data science, the green button, great concept that when a clinician is not sure what to do about a particular patient, there's the panic button that one can press to uh, accumulate information on patients like mine. And it's an enormous amount of janitorial work as well because what it really involves is beginning to use techniques to search through the unstructured text of, uh, of electronic health records. Uh, electronic health records are, are, are touted for their ability to uh, allow us to aggregate information on all of our patients. But in fact, the reality is all of the clinicians know, much of it is unstructured, it's text data. And how does one think about taking from the richness of text data, being able to put cohorts together, being able to do computation that takes into consideration the fact that this is not randomized data, and how do we then integrate that in addition with other external evidence from outside the electronic health record. It is a daunting task even in a relatively small system like ours, and an enormous amount of effort is being spent on this. The first projects have been launched in our neonatal intensive care unit to try to help with some of the common things of physiologic monitoring in, uh, in those units. And in that light, I found this patient by Griffin Weber, a young informatician at Harvard, very interesting, that appeared in uh, JAMA about a year ago. And while we're talking about taking data from the electronic health record, in fact, what Weber points out is that there's an enormous amount of information, and Topol talks about this as well, coming from other sources. It's coming from your wearable, it's coming from your real estate purchases, it's coming from the neighborhood and the health of the neighborhood that, you've, uh, that, that you live in. It's coming from a number of other sources. And just the other day, I came across this on Twitter, where Joe Selby, the director of, uh, of PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute in the United States, said that the key is linking data in electronic health records, insurance claim, registries, mobile devices, and other sources of research and care while protecting privacy. Sounds easy. This is a daunting task, but this is, I think, the opportunity where Google, Apple, IBM, Amazon, et cetera, can help us. Well, let's talk then about some of the deep dives and predictive analytics and, uh, and some of the ways that, we can, uh, that, that companies are tackling some of these problems. Flatiron is a startup company located for, right now out of uh, New York where another prominent academic, Amy Abernathy from Duke, has recently left Duke, at least on a uh, leave of absence, to, uh, to work at Flatiron to really try to take advantage of very rich data sources and partnerships with the American Society of Clinical Oncology to do deep learning and predictive analytics around cancer. IBM has also gotten into this. And for those of you who watch Jeopardy and have seen IBM Watson uh, battling it out on Jeopardy, what all that computer power can be put to use for other things as well. And they have now launched in collaboration with, uh, with 10 cancer centers, including Duke and Memorial Sloan Kettering and others, relationships to really think about how do you utilize supercomputing techniques for predictive analytics where one brings together, again, the goal that you keep seeing here is how do you bring together disparate sources of information the way that Google did years ago now for search. How do you bring that information together in a way to make it useful for providers and patients 
particularly useful for them at the point of care. Well, one way to begin to think about bringing some of that information to bear is utilizing the smartphone. As I said, there are now 1.3 billion smartphones on the globe. And this is a project being led by Mike McConnell at, uh, at Stanford in collaboration with, uh, with Apple in a project called My Heart Counts. And what My Heart Counts is, is it's a cardiology research study building upon Apple's research kit, where what the research kit is, is that you can use open source tools. So this is the basic concept, for example, of, forming of writing applications. The genius of this was to make it open source, to be able to allow creativity and uh, innovation to occur in a crowdsourcing sort of way. But what the research kit has built into it is the, is the idea that one can get consent, can do surveys, can utilize some of the increasingly sophisticated sensors in the phone, um, and can take all of that data and importantly, not send the data to Apple, but to other honest brokers of data, including universities or not-for-profit centers, et cetera. Initially, Apple launched five of these in, uh, in March of this year, including My Heart Cards, a uh, cardiology uh, study launched at, uh, at st designed and launched at Stanford. And this is Tim Cook, the, uh, the CEO of Apple at the Apple Show earlier this year in March in San Jose, putting forward the, uh, the cardiovascular study from Stanford. This happened while all of us were at the uh, American College of Cardiology this year. And this appeared while we're at the American College of Cardiology that in the first 24 hours, 11,000 individuals had given consent to uh, participate in the study. 11,000 individuals in 24 hours. That's a change of the paradigm of doing research. Well, what does my heart count have in it? There's activity data collection. I'll show you some of this. Uh, there's a fitness assessment. In fact, we now have data on over 6,000 individuals who have actually done a six-minute walk utilizing their, uh, their iPhone as a uh, accelerometer. There's risk assessment that's self-reported, but why does it have to be self-reported? Why can't you take that data out of other sources? Version one is just following people over time. Version two, which is being developed now, starts to do randomized studies, for example, of behavioral interventions. So what's in it? If you go to uh, the Apple Store, you can download My Heart Counts, and you can uh, start to understand what it is. You'll be asked to uh, create a, an identifier and a password for yourself. And I think this is very clever, using cartoon sorts of ways to, um, to give consent. And one can give consent over the course of uh, a, a series of screens where it asks you in very readable language what's going to be happening. And then you can at any time, utilizing the typical system on your uh, iPhone, turn on and off what you're willing to give. Are you willing to give them your height, your weight, your blood glucose, how much you rode your bike, the date of birth, your blood pressure, et cetera? Are you willing to, uh, every day, you'll, for, the, for those of you who participate in this, you get a reminder every day to, uh, to do your daily check-in, and it includes your happiness scale. I'll show you some of that data on, uh, on happiness. It asks you a question about sleep. It tells you how much activity you've been engaged in that day and asks you whether or not this is accurate. Um, at this point, there are about 40,000 people. Over 70,000 have actually downloaded the application. About 40,000 have uh, actually given in consent and are collecting data. And uh, the, the more tough tasks, tasks like the six-minute walk, as I said, we have about 6,000 people worth of data. You can see like a lot of applications, there's early buzz around it, and, uh, and then there's the long tail, but people are still enrolling. Well, here's the first look at some of the data. Um, this was given to me by Mike and uh, you and Ashley. Uh, this tells us, uh, this is the proportion of individuals in any given minute who are active or inactive. And so you can look both at individuals as well as population. Here's the happiness data. California, we're a pretty happy state. Um, we, we don't have Edmonton here. North Carolina's pretty happy, though not as happy as California. And, uh, and much has been made over the difference between North and South Dakota, one being very happy and one not being so happy. And uh, that's being looked into a bit more. 
We, we can ask you self-reported your fruits and vegetables, but you might imagine in another point where the data could be taken directly from, uh, from your supermarket shopping habits. And uh, Rob always gives me a hard time because I go to bed early and I get up early. But Rob, you can note that in this large um, observational study of uh, tens of thousands of people, that the people who are happiest with life go to bed early and rise early. So, uh, so Benjamin Franklin was onto this a couple of centuries ago. So a tremendously interesting way to, uh, to collect data. Now let me turn attention to the social media and how we think about sharing data with one another and how we think about communicating with one another and how we think about getting people more and more engaged in the research process. And this was a, a, a piece in the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago which commented that the new Einsteins are going to be scientists who share. And one of the ways I think people are going to share more and more in science and in medicine will be through the use of social media. And many of you are participants in social media, whether it's Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, <coughs> Wikidoc, MD Links, et cetera. Now, some of this people use for personal activities, but increasingly you're starting to see its use in science. And again, to try to make the point, moving away from this and moving to the smartphone. I found this paper um, from Harlan Krumholz group really interesting a few weeks ago. Uh, yes, it's true, you've all thought it but most of the stuff that you write, nobody reads. And uh, it, it, because most of the literature is poorly cited, the cardiovascular literature, and what Harlan talks about here is he says, the high proportion of poorly cited articles and journals suggests inefficiencies in the cardiovascular research enterprise. It's a nice way of saying nobody's reading what a lot of us are doing. And uh, are there other ways that we could communicate with each other? Well, if you just look at the monthly audience, this was um, quantified in PLOS Biology a couple years ago now. Look at the monthly audience between going to a conference and actually having a blog, a Twitter account, or being on Facebook. We're talking logarithmic differences here when you start to think about things like um, Twitter and Facebook. And many of you know Mike Gibson, and Mike has become a uh, almost Kardashian-like figure on, uh, on social media. He has uh, currently 165,000 followers. And even if a small portion of those are reading what he does, certainly that's a lot higher than uh, some of the citations that we see from, uh, from the standard literature. Now, I'm nowhere near like Mike. I have a lowly 3,000 followers, but I do use Twitter. And one of the things that I use it for as a department chair is communicating with, our, with a very large academic department. So we have a running Twitter feed on our homepage of our, um, of our department webpage where there's a group of the faculty, increasing group of the faculty, the trainees, who if you put hashtag standdom, will, uh, your Twitter feeds will come up. And it allows us to communicate about research opportunities, about things in the news about our, um, about our faculty. And I was even able to wish um, uh, Abraham Verghese, the author of Cutting for Stone, who's one of our vice chairs, a happy birthday uh, on Twitter. We use Facebook in the, in the department. And uh, d different than when Professor Armstrong was the uh, department chair and writing uh, pithy newsletters, I suspect. But, uh, but we use Facebook and our residents in particular gravitate to the, the, some of these methods of communication. We have a large amount of our residency page, I mean of our home page, devoted to the residency program. And we're using tools like Google Hangouts to help recruit uh, medical students and residents and fellows to, uh, to Stanford as well. So there's this notion of all these non-traditional um, forces in the tech world who are now interacting with academic medicine. But I think there's a more serious element to it as well. Communication is certainly has a serious dimension to it, but it's, all, it's also fun. How do we actually engage people in the research process? Well, there's been a Stanford professor who's been utilizing Facebook and Twitter to uh, promote bone marrow donations. And one of our most serious basic science groups dealing with the notion of technology um, development for, um, uh, in informatics widely utilizes Facebook and Twitter to capture information about their own research. Mayo Clinic has been using Facebook and other social media um, uh, uh, methods to attract patients for unusual syndromes, in this case, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. There's a whole series of, uh, of studies in this regard. 
And patience like me is an interesting way of patience in sort of what you would think of as the citizen scientist mold actually contributing their data that's shared with others in an aggregated way. And patients like me provides them some simple analytics to, uh, to look at their data in, a, uh, in an aggregated way. Now this all started out because an MIT trained engineer had a brother with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and he was dismayed, this will shock you, that investigators at academic places held on to their data. They didn't necessarily share it with other people because they wanted to write grants and they wanted to write papers. And he was dismayed at this. And so he said, well, why do we go to the academics? Why don't we go to the patients directly and get their data? And this is a really interesting concept. People are beginning to use Twitter to actually do research. Here was a paper on resuscitation science from Lance Becker's group at Hopkins talking about how does one look at Twitter as a way to do research. And Carolyn Fox and Joe Scalzo actually did a randomized trial last year of different methods of, uh, of using social media to increase the readership of, uh, of circulation articles. Cardiologists are not as good at it as other areas, and maybe it reflects the diseases that we care for. The cancer docs, in fact, are really good at this. This was just appearing a couple of days ago um, during the ASCO meetings, the, the large um, cancer meetings. And this comment from the BMJ came out that said, doctors are emerging on Twitter. Greater than 5,000 oncologists generate almost 140,000 tweets about cancer in 2014. How many in cardiology? Not that many. This was actually an ASCO abstract uh, about 10 days ago. And there's a group um, out on the web, MD Digital Life, which is trying to use big data network analysis, social network analysis to try to understand connections amongst people. And they just published a couple of months ago the social oncology report, trying to understand how people actually use social media to both talk about, but also teach about cancer. And so here's an example of all cancer mentions by day, and you can see the spikes during the meeting. But look at this, which I found interesting. This is skin cancer mentions. And when the Surgeon General report comes out to talk about sunscreen and sun exposure, there's a big bump. What a great way to reach people in terms of, uh, in, in terms of awareness of public health issues or when there were a new series of drugs approved for use in melanoma, you can see FDA approval, there's a spike. And I don't think this was Dr. Califf tweeting about uh, this. This is the broader, the broader oncology community. Now in closing, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about, um, about education and how tech needs to get involved here. And this is a terrific paper by Harlan Krumholz talking about there's a whole new set of tools needed to think about big data. And we're starting to do a lot of this at uh, Stanford. One of the lessons we've learned from is from the tech company, the, the Khan Academy, where you have to love a, um, a group whose mission is to say, you can learn anything, now and forever. <laughs> it's really amazing. So our Dean of Education, Charles Proba, has popularized this notion of the flipped classroom and uh, talks about lecture halls without lectures. And we've seen, for example, that our participation of our medical students has gone from very low attendance in uh, hour-long lectures to very high attendance with uh, watching video productions of the uh, lectures in three to five minute snippets and then coming to classroom to work on problem solving in cases. Outside of medical school, you start to see the universities, this was a Stanford spinoff called Coursera, which is launching courses online, the so-called massive online uh, open courses. And this can be used in medicine. This is one from one of our infectious disease faculty on antimicrobial stewardship. This course is being promoted through the World Health Organization. It's a MOOC through, uh, through Coursera. He's had now over 25,000 people take the course. That's reach, that's impact. That can't be done without big technology. And you gotta think differently about where you're gonna innovate and do things. This is a fellowship program at Stanford run by Paul Yawk, which is based on design principles. And how do you get people to think outside their traditional academic way by spending a year together in teams learning about design principle. They've done pretty good. Over the course of a decade, they've launched about 30 companies. These are some of them. And for those of you who use the Zyopatch, 
uh, that was a, uh, a spin out of uh, the biodesign program from a, a young Stanford electrophysiologist. Uh, it's a company called iRhythm. And I'm going to close with, uh, as Paul knows, he's very passionate about maintaining the humanistic aspect of, uh, of medicine. And I would say that humanism, physical examination, is not devoid of technology either. And in this particular case, we are using, through Abraham Verghese's work, iPad applications to teach the Stanford Medicine 25. So Paul, congratulations. I think of you as an innovator, a leader, a mentor, a colleague, a friend, and a touchstone. Your beloved sailing, I would, th I would thank you for all your friendship over the years. I wish you good luck and Godspeed and greetings from your friends and colleagues in Northern California. Thank you. Thank you.